So Beatrice, uh, Ricky, do we manage, do we design, do we steer, do we control? What do we do about growth in cities? Well, um, I'm on the, uh, as you know, I'm sort of sitting with Alejandro over here. Um, you know, I think that uh, what Alejandro represents and what he discusses um, is a form of architectural practice that is very much a 21st century um, tradition and paradigm where architects are finding themselves in um, positions where they're dealing with the, the mechanisms of power of cities. And um, for me, it's not just about architectural practitioners or people coming out of architecture school, but it's about architects setting up NGOs, architects um, forming groups, lobbying governments, um, starting think tanks. Architectural education um, is leading towards, um, you know, thanks to courses like this at the LSE, um, you know, all over the world at Harvard, at MIT, um, architects are, are sort of feeling their, um, the positions of power that they can reach and how much influence they can have in cities. Um, so for me, it's about architectural education and about cultural education um, moving towards um, positions of power in cities. I mean, what was striking in these two presentations and very much at the heart of what I think you just said is that in a way you, 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 you've got, um, is the issue of language. Uh, and you know, in a way, your story, your personal story of moving into the, the, the formal world of academia and needing to find a language to talk about architecture so that it was justified in, in the bigger context. And here we have the head of, you know, one of the world's most important sort of in, international institutions using a language that frankly most of the people who listen to you worry about because you're talking about density, you're talking about urban space, you're talking about uh, the quality of design in a world where that's not often used is I think one of the, uh, the important issues and therefore that goes to the heart perhaps of something we can go back to Jose which is uh, to do with, um, with education and how, how things are formed. But I, I did in a way want to pick up, given that Juan gave the world lecture of how to solve the problems of cities, rightly so, because you can't talk about it in a narrow way, is perhaps just pick up one or two things which it seemed to me totally to connect uh, in terms of your two presentations. Um, Klaus talked about the, we've lost the ability to extend the city. Right? That's a very, very, uh, uh, yeah, that you talked about planned extensions and the pictures you showed were of the famous plan of Sirda in the 1850s in, in <coughs> Barcelona. Um, and, um, and, I, and I think in many ways, if you think of the aqueduct that you showed at the end uh, a, a moment ago, or the public space that you showed in your white spaces, it, 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 the question is how do you add to it? And, and I think some of the thoughts that we've had, this is something shared with Richard Sennett and many others here, is the issue of also time, which comes into it, which and I was curious to know what you both felt about that, because w one of the, the, the biggest urgencies now is to build these number of units over a very, very short period of time, which has not been the case from the Middle Ages to the 18th century or from the 18th century to the 19th century. From the 19th century on, it's become more urgent. And perhaps we all admire the process of urban change, which is through accretion, I think that's the term that it happens slowly, things adapt, you test them and everything else. But much of the work that you dislike, but which is what we see, those last terrifying four slides of those four cities that we can't remember, are about urban intervention through rupture. Because you've got to sort of create something uh, immediate. So I'm just curious whether the two of you from different sides feel um, that there is a way in which the discipline, or, or, or in a way even the, the the legal entities, legal entities can do that because I think for Beatrice and, 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 and me involved in education or, or at least in engaging with the public on these issues, uh, that's one of the biggest question marks. Uh, I, I feel optimistic, but I'm just curious as to where that uh, uh, sort of discussion is going in your mind. Mm. No, I think that uh, uh, there's t uh, still time and a space to do uh, urbanism, yes, <laughs> uh, urbanism is still alive. And perhaps uh, not in a very good example or uh, in all the phases of its output, but the Chinese uh, urbanization is an example. 
uh, when you have a, a policy, a national policy, and you have uh, a clear uh, direction, uh, it's possible to do urbanism, uh, but although I say, I repeat, that the, that the Chinese model has some errors in the design, uh, then the question uh, is to do urbanism of good quality. Uh, the problem that uh, we face in the developing world is that the, the mm, decision makers, they are not aware about urbanism. They don't understand even what, what we are talking about. Mm. Because they understand about uh, free market, investment, the Washington consensus, the central bank, the, the, the minister of finance, the control of inflation, and I don't know what else they know. But when you say, no, but why don't you just uh, put a straight street here, you know, and then the corner instead of doing that, why don't you put the corner in that? They, they don't feel that first is their duty. In fact, they feel that it's not their duty to do so. They think that urbanization it's a kind of a spontaneous uh, thing that happens. Uh, and this is, this is the stream, uh, th this is the most serious question. There's no a philosophical complex issue that, uh, the, you know, like the fourth dimension of time we have <laughs> lost. No, 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 it's much easier. Urbanization now is happening at uh, $500 per capita when a society reached $500. In, in the past, in the beginning of the 20th century, urbanization was happening at around $2,000 per capita. Now urbanization is happening at $500 per capita. And well, because people have more information and people want to go to the city just in case there's an opportunity there. Yeah. Then the, people of, uh, the number of people arriving is much bigger than the capacity of the government to plan. But this doesn't make it impossible to plan. The problem is that the decision makers, they don't know about it. They are not aware. Even they don't feel that it's their responsibility. It's a kind of total color blindness. Joan, let me try to connect uh, Beatriz's comments about uh, education. And, and I, I'm, I have certain skepticism about the capacity of technical knowledge itself to, to produce better urbanization. Actually, John Turner, who studied a few blocks <coughs> up to the north, uh, decided in the fi late 50s to go to Peru to de-educate himself, to yeah, uh, what he good. called the de-learning of the, of the architect. So, it, I'm thinking that there's a notion of uh, ex expanding the language, which is something that Alejandro and, and Ricky have talked uh, about. But I'm curious whether it's one of technical knowledge, political will, or, uh, or learning differently, or de-learning. Mm. You know who planned uh, Philadelphia? William Penn? You know the author of Philadelphia? It's Mr. Penn himself in a night. During a night, he drew the lines of downtown Philadelphia. Then, what is important for urban planning, even now, is not the very complexity of uh, tools or, it's not, it's not a high technology. It, it, the most important thing is the political side and the political will. Uh, to introduce planning. Then if the plan is, you know, um, when the three commissioners in, in 1811, they designed Manhattan, they, you know, Manhattan was at $1,500 per capita, and the three commissioners probably they never went to Harvard. <laughs> uh, you know, and Manhattan is the most productive urban piece of the world. Then uh, the problem that, that we have lost, and the education, of course the education should be for the <coughs> students and, and uh, professionals, and this is why we earn uh, our salary. But, uh, the <laughs> but the ones to be educated first, and utmost, is the decision makers. 
because they don't have the slightest idea of what they are doing. <laughs> Alejandro, would you like to? So I'm trying to connect the uh, time and design as a, as a, in a new way that, that you were trying to ask. Um, well, I would say that uh, we were educated in, um, in a system where control about form. It was about form making, but that form had to be controlled. I, w I still think that it is about form. Ultimately, we still have to do forms, mm -hmm. but maybe the new thing is that we have to deal with open system and not with closed systems. So you frame and channel forces instead of controlling the forces. That's one thing. Regarding time, what we have found in our practice, and, and somehow it's our, our modest opinion as a conclusion from what we found on working on in the field, is two dimensions of time, compressing and stressing time, and then having a much, much expanded notion of time. What do I mean by this? You just said, Philadelphia plant overnight. Uh, when you have crisis, when you have natural disasters uh, so, or, or uh, immigration crisis, you have a pressure to come up with something in much shorter times than conventional planning that I guess it lacks the kind of tension that that moment of synthesis is required. So even though it's a cliche, the window of opportunity of crisis and disasters shouldn't be missed. Otherwise, we invent artificial ones, Olympic Games and, and World Cups and something to which put you a deadline, which I think is a good thing. I was last Friday in, in Stockholm. They receive 10,000 immigrants per week. That's a window of opportunity that you need to use to compress and stress time. So that's one thing which I, I think it's very important. Conventional timing, kind of multi-year kind of thing, won't make it. So it's a good thing. The counterpart of this. When you have people being responsible of many of the constructions, this open system that people will build anyhow, even if you don't want to, they will, it's a fact that they will build. If you put, sit them on the table on day one, since they are going to be part, part responsible and split tasks, then if they feel that they, they have been there in the moment where that vision was synthesized, then they might be the only ones there when authorities change. No relevant change in cities will happen in political timing. The take time, uh, relevant changes take, take place in periods of time that may be two periods or three periods. So if you had a good participatory process, but not in the cliche of the romantic hippie kind of thing, I mean, if we really split tasks and responsibilities, they may be the only guarantee of the continuity of that vision. So I guess that this other dimension of longer periods of time combined with stressing time offers a clue for this way of having su successful open, not controlled systems. Alejandro, uh, Baron Lafitte has a saying that goes like, uh, making wine is easy, it's only the first 200 years that it is difficult. <laughs> <laughs> and and in, uh, maybe cities are like that. I'm, I'm curious whether the favelas of Rio will become the urbinos or of a, of a, in, in a few years. Uh, uh, Beatriz, uh, maybe in your experience in, uh, as curator of, of uh, the Lisbon uh, Trinale, I'm, I'm curious whether this education extends both at the level of uh, decision makers but also at society as large to include in more participatory processes. Um, yeah, in Lisbon, um Two years ago, um, we made a, you know, me and um, four other curators um, worked together to try and demonstrate a certain plurality, um, a certain ways in which architects were acting in the crisis in Portugal. Um, and many of them were connecting. Um, they had no ways of building traditionally. There was no formal outcome. And you know, when you were saying, oh, uh, you know, what would we do with social housing? Is it a book or an exhibition? I mean, that's essentially the form of practice that was that was really taking place in Lisbon. And um, you know, there was, for example, a young practice arteria who were uh, whose whose project was simply to document all of the empty houses in Lisbon, um, allocate uh, floor plans, take photographs of them, put them online. Um, and connect them to the possible owners and developers and architects. And so, in a way, for them, architectural practice was about mobilizing resources and connecting people to systems in, in, in a similar way. Um, and, you know, also, I lived in China and I did a Biennale, uh, Shenzhen Biennale in China, and this was a city 
that was so ex you know exponentially extraordinarily um, you know catapulted into the 21st century and um, there we worked with people who were coming from the countryside part of who were there when it was like 1981 in a fishing village and we were able to um, you know work with them to kind of create a cultural project that was um, part of the Biennale there um, a kind of little you know, kind of urban interventions that were supposed to be temporary but were then absorbed by the local people and became permanent installations in the city. And I think that, um, you know, for me, being a curator, it's not about um, representing past projects but actually kind of enabling a certain agency through cultural production. Um, so using, you know, whatever, you know, you guys have both are doing biennales, um, there are ways of doing them that really um, isn't just about reflection, but is really about production. And I think that's when you know you can really make it sort of provide support for other architects and provide a platform for other ways of making architecture and doing architecture. I mean, I think one one of the key things, sort of the processes you're also describing, um, is a process of actually engaging with what is there. And the case of Lisbon, interesting, you say that was at a time, you know, very severe crisis, and how do you intervene? It to breathe life back into it, or in the cases of you know these mega cities that you're describing, how do you civilize them? I mean, at the heart of that approach, I think implicit in what is being said is is the notion of sort of retrofitting, which was you you take what is there and you try to improve it in a way with with sort of um, uh, minimal means. And yes, you're right that Mr. Penn designed the city overnight. That's not that interesting. What's interesting about it is that over the next 200 years it adapted. Mm. Uh, your point about the 1811 plan is that actually New York has been able to completely transform itself. Uh, areas that were uh, fashion districts have become uh, art houses, have become condos, what, whatever it is, but the street structures remain the same. The model for us which is relevant is the, let's say, the Georgian house in London or places like um, Notting Hill, which you know were designed for one thing, um, middle class housing at the turn of whatever, early 19th century, then became nearly squatter settlements, student housing, uh, drug dealing territory, and now you can't even park your BMW or your Audi because <laughs> it's become so uh, intense. What has remained the same is the urban infrastructure. And, and I think uh, these are ways of actually uh, retrofitting and re, working with what is there, um, but also understanding this issue of time, Alejandro, which I think is, is what, what, um, yeah, what, what matters. Yeah. So, so just designing it overnight, so what? Yeah, I mean, no, that, that's but, not uh, going to work. No, the problem is that uh, in, in most of the developing world, the level of a spontaneous urbanization of people arriving to the city is so, so yes. high that they do the metastat metastatic growth Yes. Like the cancer, eh, around yeah, that sure, they, yeah, they yeah. put themselves whatever they can. Yeah. And then if you want to resettle or re replan these uh, settlements, right. it becomes extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it becomes, in a, in a democratic society, it becomes a huge conflict. Then this is why the relevance of making political decisions in advance or as soon as possible, it's so crucial. Mm -hmm. Because as more the decision is delayed, the problem became worse. Mm -hmm. This is the dramatic situation of urbanization, mm -hmm. that the, the politicians, the decision makers, they are absent because they don't feel as it's their duty to plan, and in fact, the spontaneous urbanization is happening at a mass scale. This is the time problem, mm -hmm. okay. that, that, that we need to change that as soon as possible. For example, planet cities tensions in these places are becoming very difficult because there's even no land around uh, free that you can use as a planet city station. Uh, then if, if we don't rush, while we are talking here, 20,000 people more have been, uh, squattered uh, surroundings of mega cities, just in, in one hour. There's not, a, there's not a small paradox that the, the politician is defending design, and the architect is defending <laughs> management in a way. Uh, and I, but, but <laughs> let, me, let me make a, a quick comment on, on, on what you've just said. If, if some favelas will become urbino or not, well, it, if they got the nolly right, maybe. But if the, you got, I mean, what you're just saying, if okay. that initial uh, geometrical grid, uh, uh, black and white, public and, and private, is not right, 
they will never do so. But eventually, if that, if that is right at the very beginning, they may. Yeah. In, the, in, the, in the 70s, <coughs> late 60s and, and 70s uh, during Allende, in Chile there was a very interesting uh, way to try to cop with the, the amount of people migrating uh, towards cities, and it, the translation would be Operation Chalk. That meant that the only thing that you had were chalk to, nice. to, nice, yeah. to ro draw the grid, so you define the roads, the private lots, and not even the swatch and the water, but then if that was right, then you can't keep on upgrading over time. So that incrementality, it, it may lead the initial slum into Urbino or, or, uh, or Manhattan if, if that initial form is it's there's, a, there's a very nice natural experiment <coughs> in urbanization which is fantastic. Uh, is the upper height uh, uh, urbanization in South Africa? The, the, the free towns, what is the name of the places? The, the uh, town townships. 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 They were designed uh, with uh, streets because the police wanted to have easy access. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, 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 uh, and, and, and then they designed these, these, uh, these townships. And, uh, but one day, Upper Height disappeared. <laughs> it was no more Upper Height. And now, if you go to South Africa, you compare the, the, these townships with the, the small surroundings or slums uh, nearby Joburg. Which do you think is better? The townships. The townships. <coughs> Even planning done for bad purpose, Reasons. if it's good, <laughs> it's going to serve the purpose. Absolutely. At the long. Eh? Mm -hmm. But uh, wouldn't you say that also the right knowledge that you showed at from yes, Paris, yes. it's also a retrofitted knowledge, well, by in the, the way. Well, uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I find interesting that in the kind of uh, those moments of magnificent in Sanchez and grow the commissioner's plan, uh, Hausman and Cerda, those happened at a moment where we had the most pessimism about cities. Mm. And nowadays, in probably the new golden age of urbanism or cities, we don't have planners. Yeah, but you know, if in 1811, the three commissioners in Manhattan, they were able to design the streets that we walk there now, why at the 21st century, we cannot do the same again? Well, you just what, spent what, an hour what? telling us why. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's dramatic, isn't it? It's dramatic, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Which then goes back to the education of, of I of guess the a possible answer is because we don't trust simplicity. Uh, well. The more complex the problem, the more the need for the simple answer. And then I guess all the consultants yeah, yeah. and experts want to sell complexity. Yeah. Uh, so in no, the and, end, and what, cities, how in cities in form of a plane, <laughs> <Yeah>. like <laughs> Brasilia, like if this, uh, like if Brasilia was going to take off, eh? <laughs> you know, why is the bloody reason why a city should have a form of a plane? <laughs> and in order to make things more complex, uh, let's open the the floor for discussion. Uh, the way we're going to do it is maybe uh, four or five questions, and we'll let the the panel answer. So uh, please be brief. Uh, don't stretch with long commentaries. We have ten minutes. One. Two, three, and four, four. The one economist. <laughs> okay, finally. <laughs> okay. Um, can you listen to me? Yeah, well. Um, yes, yeah, so you spoke about all the cities looking the same these days and all the bad parts of all the cities that we know and love. But if you want to inspire a generation of policymakers or architects or designers or anything, where would you tell us to look? Yeah. 
where do you tell us, where do we tell us to move? Tell them to move? Ah, okay. Uh, here. <laughs> Hi, uh, my question is for Alejandro. Uh, my name is Fernanda, I'm from Brazil, and I'm very interested in how can we engage people living in slums that is already built. built. So uh, how can we engage them uh, to rebuild in one plan like at the Elemento, that they, they have to build the other 50%? Wait, wait. For the record. For the record. Especially in Indian China. Well, I'm slightly troubled by the assumption that is all problems c concerning urbanism can be solved through better design. Uh, I think I want to bring the question of livelihood. The world is full of beautiful design buildings and and structures, but without proper economic means of sustenance. In fact, they actually have never been realized. So in some sense, uh, uh, w the assumption is that we are neglecting the major problem which f faces the third world cities. The second is when we talk about planning, we assume that there is a functioning government. In a lot of cities of the third world, there are ab many urban areas, a complete lack of governance. Can we take a one mm -hmm. first? Time? One, maybe yeah. one more, and then we answer. One more. One more. Here. Um, thank you for your sharing. Um, I come from Hong Kong, and in Hong Kong, it's really like. Um, Architects, like you mentioned, uh, only or like a lot of the urban planning in Hong Kong is driven by money, and the government and the developers work together to develop the city in a way. And how how can we convince the government that we need to work with the people and co-design and to lead to better well-being and livelihood of the people and the city for the well-being of everyone? Because not all the architects in Hong Kong are like you guys. <laughs> okay. You want? Yeah. Me? Yeah. But short, huh? No, 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 no. You better, yeah. you, you no, no don't say don't exhaust. No, I, I'll try. Because I, I have spoken too much. I, I'll, well, all the questions are, are, are good. I'll try to to combine a bit uh, inequality and engaging of people. Um, Start with inequality. A big, big underlining of, of, uh, of that is a major, major issue in the sense that, for example, take Chile. Chile at the moment is a country of $22,000 per capita a year. If you take out, we're, we're 17 million people, so let's say uh, 4 million families. If you take out 1,000 families, income drops to $10,000 per capita per year. So that's the embarrassing level of inequalities in a country like Chile. So the, if there's any agreement in the political spectrum of the country is that we do have a problem with inequalities. What's the only thing that is being heard to correct inequalities? Redistribution of income. As if inequalities was an economical problem only. Uh, it is economical, it's social, it's racial, it's uh, cultural. And in that sense, <coughs> the assumption is to correct inequalities, uh, better education, because if you're better educated, you, have, you can have access to a better salary, and by having a better salary, you may buy yourself a better house or a better car instead of going in, in public transportation that is really inefficient and so on and so forth. But if anything, <coughs> I would say that cities are a shortcut towards equality. If you identify strategically projects in the city, take public transportation, without changing income, without changing where you live, two hours away in the periphery, without changing anything, 
the quality of life that you can improve by making an efficient public transportation system, it's huge. Let's assume that people is seated on a bus. How much does that cost? Compared to the other thing, it's a much more efficient way. Public space, again, if you can improve quality of life in Chile, if you want to take a distant walk, continuous walk, you can only do that if you're a member of a golf club. <coughs> if you have a public space that capitalizes geography in a magnificent way, like Rio de Janeiro does with the sidewalks, for example, it's a huge way to correct inequality. So from that point of view, I would say that cities are an extremely powerful and efficient vehicle to correct inequalities, uh, becoming a kind of a shortcut. The thing is that <clears throat> we may eventually need, need to ask people uh, about what is the problem that is it's pressing them. We had a, um, the, the experience in the reconstruction of the city after the earthquake, uh, and the question was how to protect the city after a tsunami. And uh, we were about, as a country, to uh, answer well the wrong question. When people was asked, they said, okay, uh, tsunami may be an issue, but it's going, the next one is going to be in 20, 25 years. But every single year we have a problem with the flooding of the rain. We do not have public space that is decent, so they may earn some money there around the forest industry, but the quality of life is extremely poor. The identity of the city was connected to the geography of the river, but it was privately owned. Nobody could have access to the river. So I guess if you ask and if you intend the process of participation, not as a way to get answers from the people, but as a way to identify with precision what is the question, then eventually that may give a clue so that afterwards those forces are channeled in the proper way. Let me take the, the question of the second interview, the, 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 the second uh, You have asked about how to train the people to design better, uh, and about the four photos that I presented. One characteristic of common to the four photos is that there's architecture, more or less, but there's no urbanism plan. Have you looked at that? If you look at the four photos, they are with in, a, in an open <coughs> space. There's, there's a building which is done with no restriction of, uh, provided by the public space. The designer was able to use the public space as they like. It's a little bit of this tendency of the international model of, uh, of uh, architecture that they take the project and instead of being forced to build like Gaudí was forced to build in a plot in a street or the chaps in New York, they are forced to build the high rises in a plot or on, on the street grid, they can use the, the land of the street as, they, as ever they occur to them. And of course, if they don't understand the logic of the public space, they, they, produ they can produce monsters. Huh? Then I think that it's very important first, in order to, to, to improve <coughs> architecture, is to have, to, to put architecture in a balanced way with urbanism. There's no such a thing as just a project alone. It needs to be balanced with our, the, the, the urbanism, the public space. The other question is, how, how we train for good taste? Because at the, problem, at the end, it's a question of bad taste. <laughs> then, you know, uh, how, how you train the people to, you know, you need to study, you need to go to the museums, you need to try to, you know, to cultivate yourself, to, to, to appreciate beauty. Uh, you know, it's not something that comes uh, just, uh, you, you know, uh, it requires some, some mental effort. <laughs> it's, not just, it's not just doing what, whatever. Eh? You know, Frank Geris or Saha Sahid say it's, there are no men in the world. Eh? Then, for the normals of us, we need to follow some rules and, and to train ourselves and try to do things with good taste. Eh? <laughs> you know? I think we, it's 8.05 and I promise to get you all out of here by 8 o'clock. So uh, 
I just want to thank our panelists and presenters, Alejandro, Beatriz, Ricky, Joan, fantastic uh, conversation. Everyone, Ute, uh, thank you, and uh, Her House and Society of the Deutsche Bank, uh, LSE Cities and Urban H for bringing us here. On Wednesday, we have uh, Saskia Sassen and Anthony Williams who will be here discussing questions of who owns the city. So the questions of equity we promise to touch upon on, on Wednesday. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>